concentration of greenhouse gases of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has never been as high as it is today. And the problem is we don't know what will happen out of this. There are different models. As I mentioned already, some models indicate that we go in this direction, this part of the world. Others indicate we go in that direction. Nobody knows for sure. But according to the precautionary principle that we have adopted in the European Union, we should be careful. And the idea is whether to mitigate climate change or to reduce the human-made carbon dioxide emissions on a global level. So that's the idea of the paper, and uh, that's what I would like to talk about. So what is it about? If you are looking at uh, climate change, at global warming, then of course we all understand that it's kind of a global public good, a global environmental commodity. And uh, we all have to cooperate. Many countries in the world, at least all major countries in the world, have to cooperate in order to mitigate climate change. Just look at the numbers here. So here we have uh, China with 8 billion tons of carbon dioxide yearly, and we have United States with 5.2, and India with 1.8, but with a strong increasing tendency, of course. And then we have Russia with 1.6 billion tons, and we have Germany with just 0.7 billion tons. And we all understand that even if we, in Germany, we would shut down any sources of carbon dioxide, then this would not have any effect on the climate. So we need a global cooperation, and these countries here, of course, are highly diverse. So look at China, we have emerging countries, we have developing countries, such as India, we have industrialized countries, such as the United States, we have countries with a socialist background, we have countries with a capitalist background, we have different demographic developments in various countries. All these things might play a role regarding the question of mitigating climate change. So if you think about, if you think about uh, what's going to happen in Paris in less than four weeks from now, it will be the 21st conference of the parties of the Kyoto Protocol in Paris, and it will be a decisive meeting. And the goal is to reach, a global, reach an agreement on global substantial reductions of greenhouse gas emissions you can understand what it means. So, how can we bring together these highly diverse countries in order to join in the forces to mitigate climate change or, if you want, to reduce at least greenhouse gas emissions? That's somehow the topic of the paper. And uh, in order to uh, investigate this, this issue, I would like to set up a formal model, very simple, actually very simple formal model, and we would like to investigate it from a theoretical point of view. So we will introduce a kind of a latent variable, latent variable in the sense that we cannot directly observe it. It will be called awareness of global warming, but what is it? We cannot directly observe it. We can only uh, see how it works through various indicators. And one of the indicators I'm going to use is simply the share of renewable of electricity from renewable sources. That's at least one indicator for uh, awareness of climate change. And the uh, question, of course, is then other questions which come up immediately. If you are a little bit familiar with the concept of an environmental Kuznets curve, is this awareness somehow related to economic variables? Of course, that's one thing one would like to have. If we know, for example, that a higher GDP per capita, higher welfare in particular states, increases awareness, it would be a nice thing. But we could always say, just let countries grow, let China grow, let India grow, and then sooner or later, they will come upon the issue, across the issue of global warming, and will try to reduce carbon dioxide emissions substantially. Okay, that's an interesting point. 
just let me mention I will come to the issue of NATO here because what I'm telling you now of course is you can it, it means basically burden sharing for a global in this case global environmental commodity but you could also call it burden sharing for a public commodity that's what it is and you have the same issues in NATO yeah NATO burden sharing means here military expenditures for NATO purposes and uh, to some extent diversity of the countries does play a role in NATO yeah for example Estonia probably has a different awareness than, than Norway in this, in this issue so we have a similar thing that's why I'm coming to NATO occasionally at least it's quite interesting actually so well here in red you try to understand the, I will also come to empirical results, the empirical allocation, and uh, we try to understand to what extent this awareness plays a role, and so on. So just to remind you, if you don't know uh, what an environmental Kuznets curve is, here is a very nice example of it. It shows uh, sulfur dioxide emissions, and uh, uh, the result shows uh, that when countries are developing here from a very low level of GDP per capita and uh, once they reach the level of approximately 5,000 US dollar per year these are dollars I think in the purchasing power of 1990 then uh, they start to realize that sulfur dioxide doesn't smell particularly mm -hmm. nice so <laughs> that's when they start to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide. So that's what the environmental Kuznets curve says, that uh, it's after some uh, level of development, of economic development, uh, things become better, at least in a country on average. But we should be careful. This, of course, this thing was quite nice, and everybody now thinks that uh, Again, once we have these 5,000 US dollars, whatever, then uh, the problem with sulfur dioxide will just disappear. But of course, that's not true. That's a, it's a global development because many developing countries are now producing sulfur dioxide and using it and so emitting it. That means that on a global level, sulfur dioxide emissions will continue to increase. So be careful when you think about the environmental Kuznets curve. Okay, let me come back to global warming and uh, briefly to this 21st conference of the parties in Paris in uh, less than four weeks from now. And uh, the idea once more is to reach an agreement to reduce global warming to maximum of, of two degrees, but many scientists doubt that this goal is still attainable, but uh, that's not our issue today. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to this article in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is behind the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, this, of course, points to this need to share the burden between the parties on the basis of equity. However, in accordance with the common but differentiated responsibility and capabilities. That's a tricky issue, of course, and uh, that will play a big role in these ne negotiations in Paris. It means, of course, that industrialized countries will have different responsibility than, for example, developing countries. But to what extent? I mean, that's okay, but to what extent? So, again, uh, what is currently happening? Let's look at this. Uh, I just put together some numbers and I calculated now the, the consumption, or more, ex uh, more exactly the cost of uh, using electricity from renewable sources in various countries. I feel sorry for you, from Wildur, <laughs> because Norway is. <laughs> somewhere on the bad end of this, <laughs> this diagram, <laughs> but it will become better, I can tell you, I can promise you, <laughs> later. 
Did you, did you exclude hydro? This, uh, this we excluded hydro. We had to exclude hydro yeah. because hydro, using hydropower at least uh, had different reasons. I understand that Norway is... is yeah, so that's what it is. And I think we, we don't uh, recognize any particular structure in this, in this diagram. So there's nothing which is uh, related to a Kuznets curve. Was it uh, right to use hydro? Because, I mean, I guess uh, I know. solar is not an option for Norway. So right, to, right. so right to exclude hydro in this in these numbers is it's not, not me alone. Many many people are doing this right now. They say uh, to to build hydro electronic hydroelectric power stations uh, has always been an issue some hundred years ago already, and it has been done for different reasons, not not because of climate change. Yeah. Right now I agree that uh, some countries like uh, like uh, Slovakia, they are using hydropower stations, for example, maybe also for the reasons of, uh, of, uh, of climate change mitigation. I'm not sure about that. Yeah? That's one of the reasons. But I understand that there are countries like Norway which depend on, on hydropower stations. Or Switzerland, it's also the same. But, but would it not be correct to exclude hydropower because this is very unevenly distributed among countries? Yes. Some countries just cannot produce any hydropower, like Denmark? There's no way that you could have a hydroelectric power plant. That's there. another reason. That's exactly another reason because hydropower depends on geographic uh, uh, possibilities. That's one. But of course, there's, there's an issue with it. That's not, it's not uh, really, uh, well, I should do something else. A little bit else. But anyway, there is no structure in, in, this, in this thing that's what's happening right now. And uh, so, probably the decisions to make use of renewable energy sources here uh, depends on, on many other variables which we, would, which we don't know yet, but which we would like to capture in this what I call awareness. So with this awareness concept, I would try to, to capture all this uh, diversity among the countries, so non-economic diversities among the countries, integrate them somehow and see what, what role do these things play. And uh, just let me briefly mention that the concept of environmental awareness is already quite old. It uh, showed up, I think, in the 1960s already, and it was in, turned up in marketing, marketing and social psychology. Well, marketing, I think, is clear. Marketing specialists always try to, to cluster people, and if there is a group of people which could be called environmental aware, then, of course, this group of people could be targeted with special products, bio food, or I don't know what, yeah, we know this thing. Yeah. That's the reason why we have this concept already some 50 years. <clears throat> okay, so these are the things. What role does awareness play? Awareness integrates all these uh, diverse uh, variables, factors, which make countries different. That's at least the idea, the non economic variables. And uh, we also want to look whether this awareness at least follows. Um, the environmental Kuznets curve. And we want to do this both from a theoretical point of view and an empirical point of view. That's a nice thing about this paper. Here, just uh, you look at the EIT countries. These are, uh, what does it mean? Uh, in transition, in economies in transition, EIT, economies in transition. Yeah, so Russia and, and Properly, Georgia should also be there, but I couldn't find it in this, in this list. So you see this uh, carbon dioxide emissions per capita, but it also there is no environmental Kuznets curve here detectable. Okay? This is like years, is it not the year? Every year, uh, uh, years, yeah, they just collect the years. And so that always contains GDP per capita and uh, the per capita emissions. So that's what it is. So the question is, can we find some structure? Economists don't like these pictures because they want to like yeah, a, clear, a clear desk. They want to know what, what's happening here. Otherwise, you can't do anything. If you, don't, if you don't understand such a picture, what is it? The model. The model is, once more, is, is actually quite simple. And uh, so we have a set of countries which might be parties to the Kyoto Protocol, or might be 
countries of the European Union or EITs or whatever, it doesn't matter in this case. And uh, <clears throat> we have just two commodities, a private commodity and of course a public commodity. Private commodity is, is X and public commodity is Y. In our context, the private commodity will be, for simplicity, GDP, the country, which can be eaten up or it can be used to produce the public commodity, at least to some extent. Yeah. That's the usual idea. And uh, uh, the public commodity, of course, provides benefits. And in our case, of course, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a public commodity because it uh, mitigates climate change. Or at least it uses here global carbon dioxide emissions. Good. And we can also do it per capita. Then we get here WI, which is GDP per capita. And uh, then, uh, of course, we use, as usual, identical uh, utility functions for, for everybody. And they are also homothetic, but I don't care with these things. And we have one parameter. That's now the critical issue. So this alpha i is now what I call awareness parameter. So what is the reason for calling it? We are now still in theory, so I can do that, I think. What is the reason for calling it awareness? Well, if you look at the marginal rate of substitution in this context, then you get immediately this simple formula. Everybody knows it, and it just says that the higher level of alpha, alpha i, just means ceteris paribus, the higher level of higher willingness to pay for the public commodity. And in this sense, I think it's fair to say that alpha i is kind of an awareness for this public commodity. Yeah, that's what it is. A higher level of alpha i means a higher willingness to pay for this public commodity. Good. So that's all. Now, what can we do? Of course, we have to produce. I, I told you that as an indicator, so we have awareness, an indicator of, of a, of awareness for global warming is the, the willingness to produce electrical energy from renewable sources, excluding hydroelectricity. Okay? So now we have to produce this electricity. That's just a question. So my utility only depends on how much I consume of the private good and the public good. The public good like what the others do in the public good is no, no. not affecting my utility. So no, 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 no. The public good is the public good. So everybody contributes the public good and you consume what all others are doing. I will, let me just, okay. I, will come, I will come to that, yeah? Of course not, it's not what, what you are. So I why... You have no index, actually. This will so come, this, 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 will, this will come in a, in a There's no index, okay. just index. Yeah? Okay. And uh, so we have to, to produce this uh, electrical energy from renewable sources. And we all know at least from those countries who are coming from those countries who are using renewable energies, that it costs quite a lot. So we in Germany, we meanwhile pay five or six euro cents per kilowatt hour for uh, renewable energy. So it's quite a lot, yeah? Five, six euro cents per kilowatt hour. If you consume 3,000 kilowatt hours per year as a typical household, so it's, it is something, okay? So, and uh, for Bringing in these costs, I use the concept of, of levelized costs of energy. I don't want to go into this, what it is, it just means what does it cost to produce one kilowatt hour of uh, electrical energy from particular sources. And in this case, of course, I mean the average. So typical countries, they use photovoltaic modules, they use biogas, they use windmills, they, don't, they use I don't know what. So in principle, you have to calculate this average for, for each country, it also depends on the climatic conditions, how much energy you can produce, and things like that. So it's very difficult. Uh, do you also consider the small scale or the big scale all together, all the renewable uh, theories? The data, that I, the, well, the data that I had, they referred to the main sources, the main to photovoltaic, biogas, and wind. Yes, I mean, uh, a utility scale photovoltaic or a uh, household scale? Everything, 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 yeah. Everything. So uh, then I, I, there are some estimates on this. So we know, for example, what a kilowatt hour of electrical, of, a, of, of 
and electricity from renewable sources from photovoltaic modules cost in Germany. We know what it costs in, in other countries. But again, to take into account this, this mixture that we also have windmills in Germany and, and biogas plants, that's of course a tricky issue. So uh, these are very rough estimates that I have in this case. And uh, okay, when, if we make use of this, then we can rewrite the utility function. Can rewrite it in the following way. So that's the original formulation. That is uh, country I. This is individual trade of country I. So we have KI individuals in the various countries. And uh, this is a part of the private commodity. So this is GDP per capita. And we have to subtract the expenses on uh, electricity from renewable sources. This beta I are these levelized costs in country I. And here is the uh, public commodity. And now you see that it includes contributions from, from everybody yeah, in this case. So that's just rewriting the uh, utility function, nothing else. So now the question, of course, what do we do? What is the allocation mechanism? It's not straightforward also. What is the allocation mechanism? How do we sort things out in this, in this context? Well, there are, just look at uh, the papers from these various conferences that we have. And there was a Lima climate change conference uh, last year. And uh, there is written that the parties to the Kyoto Protocol are invited to communicate their intended nationally determined contributions well in advance of the 21st session. That is a session that's going to be held in three weeks. And uh, in a manner that facilitates clarity, transparency, and understanding of the intended national contributions. And uh, well, to some extent, this implies, this transparency implies that each country has a chance to look at least what the others are planning or they were, what they are intending to do. So there seems to be some dependence of a country's decisions on what others are doing or planning to do. Okay, that's what it means. And uh, that's why we use the Nash mechanism. I propose to use the Nash mechanism as an allocation tool in this context. Okay, let's look at this is a for this uh, intended nationally determined contributions. Uh, for selected countries. And uh, so, for example, we have here uh, Australia plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 26, 28 percent. Target year is 2030, and the so reference year is 2005. And uh, Canada, then we have China, from 60 to 65 per unit of GDP. But this implies, of course, that or means that they are just willing to reduce emissions by 35 to 40 percent. And now, if you think that China, let China grow with 5 percent per year between 2015 and 2030, then you can easily figure out that these uh, reduction efforts they are more than will be more than compensated by, by the growth. So China will simply continue to have increasing carbon dioxide emissions. That's that's straightforward, but at least it's an effort. For for Russia, <laughs> well, for Russia, uh, they want to stay 25 percent, 30 percent below the level of 1990. That's exactly where they are right now. So after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, industry broke down and carbon dioxide emissions went down. So right now they are still some 25 percent below the levels of 1990. So for them it means just uh, keep this level or decouple economic growth from carbon dioxide emissions. That's what it is. And so on. And uh, there, of course, we have European Union countries, high ambitions, 40% reductions. The base here is 1990. Norway joined also as a party, so try to do a better job now in the future, <laughs> at least. And, uh, and so on. So there's also no clear strategy in this thing. There are some, of course, discussions, China, United States, you know, these things and so forth. Okay. So now we agreed, or I proposed at least, the Nash mechanism. But uh, the Nash mechanism, there are still various alternatives what we can do. 
And uh, the first alternative is to assume that each individual agent maximizes utility and uh, given the actions of all the other agents. It's one, one model. Second model would be that uh, each agent assumes that all the agents in, in, in the same country will act uh, accordingly and uh, takes this into account. And there's a final version that uh, not the individual agents are the actors, but the countries are the actors. Well, in this case, here, you know, governments make the decisions and uh, of course the initial endowment of the government would then be GDP altogether and not only GDP per capita. So what to do? Which one to choose? Let me first tell you that the last two ones here, they lead to the, uh, the same results. You can just look at the first world conditions and you can see it. And, uh, but I propose to use the first one. Why? Well, of course, usually government uh, make decisions on, on this uh, renewable energies business, but governments couldn't do this without the consent of the majority of the people. At least the democratic countries would not be possible to do it. So that's why I assume this first approach. And by the way, even if you're not happy with this, the second approach would yield different results, but not substantially different from, from the first one. Okay? But we can argue about that. So now let's look at this. Let's, let's look at the first order conditions. So will you remember these utility functions that I, that I used? and uh, differentiated, it's quite simple and straightforward. What we see immediately, if we look at the ages of one country, then the left-hand side of this equation are always identical, always the same. Okay? There's, nothing, there's nothing different. But if the left-hand sides are always the same, the right-hand sides must be two. And this implies immediately that all ages of one country they have the same action. Yeah? These things are here yeah, identical, and these things here must be identical. This helps to simplify all these calculations tremendously. Well, that's this result here. And then we can rewrite the first order conditions just by summing up. So K1, for example, is the number of people living in country one. So we have K1 times T1 and so on. And this is our first order condition. And here I use uh, WI. WI is GDP per capita. And I divide it by beta I by the price for renewable energy in country I. And so I get, of course, we know this from microeconomics, the first class in microeconomics. Then, of course, we get uh, income in terms of, of uh, renewable in, in electricity or kilowatt hours in renewable energy. Okay, so that's what I'm, these are the first order conditions. And what we have to do now is, of course, Nash mechanism, we have to solve these equations for T1 and Tn and so, and so on. So, before I continue, let me uh, have a look at, uh, at the literature. Here, we have some papers. Here are the, the classical papers by Bergstein and Bloom. So, it's been a long time ago. And Moulin, 87. Then uh, we have a paper on, on NATO, which actually took up this issue a long time ago already. And uh, then Grossman Krüger was also a very influential paper. And then, of course, there is a, a huge variety of, of, of later publications in the area. Just have to look at the literature. Okay, now some simple first results, which are not very important, but which just uh, show that uh, the concept that we have applied makes some sense. And the first result shows that if we have a higher awareness in these solutions and in consideration of a higher GDP per capita, then this also gives rise to a higher contribution, which is quite natural and what, what would be expected. Okay, yes, that's what a higher awareness should do. If it were the other way around, then I think we would have chosen the wrong concept. And similarly, also total contributions will increase with GDP capita <coughs> and also with a higher awareness. The same story. Just one simple results, comparative static results, that show that the uh, concept is okay. So now, let me come to burden sharing. That's the one issue. Burden sharing is a big topic. Burden sharing means we have a global problem in our case, or let's say NATO, we have a problem, and uh, how to share the burden among the various countries, among diverse countries. 
So we have the problem of global warming. We want to mitigate global warming. We know it will cost us a lot of money. Who should pay for it? So what is the general perception? What do people think about these solutions? That's why I called it expected or wanted results. So what we typically can find in the literature is, of course, what we call that stronger shoulders, they should carry more, not only more, but more than proportionally more. That's what you usually can read. So here, if uh, GDP per capita in country I is higher than in country J, then, of course, also uh, this contributions, beta I and T and times T I are the expenditures for renewable energy in country I measured uh, as a share of GDP, they should be higher than in the other country. That's what we would like to have. Yeah? That's those who are strong, they should carry more, but not proportionally, but more than proportionally. The same is true for NATO. That's also we would, what we would like to have. Here in NATO, the formulas become simpler because I'm just talking about money and not renewable energy, so don't, don't have to use a production function. Okay. So what results do we get in the paper, in this theoretical model? So we get the following results. You see here that uh, this year, so countries spend uh, more than proportionally more in, than the other country. If uh, GDP per capita weighted by this parameter alpha i divided by beta i is greater or equal to the same thing of the other country. So we see how awareness now plays a role, comes into the picture. So it's not only GDP per capita which is important, but also awareness and of course also the cost, the cost for producing this renewable energy. In NATO again it becomes simpler, again because we don't have this beta I in this case. So we see what role this thing is playing. What are the consequences now? There's a first simple, simple empirical application, but you should be careful because this first application is dependent on these estimations of beta i, which are very shaky, which are very rough estimates. Yeah? I don't... For example, we could here look at, at this here. So ti over tj greater or equal wi hat over wij. And then we get this equivalence here. Yeah? So we do this for Germany, Tg. So Tg is simply the uh, kilowatt hours of renewable energy or electricity from renewable energy in Germany and we divide it as per capita and we divide it by those of other countries. Here we get these numbers for a, for a list of countries. And then we do the same thing with this uh, per capita income expressed in uh, kilowatt hours of renewable energy use Germany and divided by WI. And we see in this result that the values for Germany are always above those here. These values here are always higher than these ones. Okay? Three points, so zero is higher than this one here, this is higher than this one, and so on. What does it mean? Very simple application for our results. Now we have this formula. So we have this here for each other country. And then this implies this is equivalent to, to this one. Yeah, that's results just from, from this formula here. This here, we have this one here, is equivalent to this one. But now, so if this is true, here this is greater or equal this one here. We know that this is true for each country. So the so values for Germany, alpha j times w hat j, are greater or equal the other values. Now look at these numbers here. This is GDP per capita expressed in uh, renewable in electricity from renewable energy sources. So the value for Germany is lower than in the UK, in Brazil, and in China. Now, if this level for Germany is lower than this one here, but we have this inequality here, and the consequence is that awareness in Germany must be higher than in the other countries. Okay? So that's how you, and once more, these numbers here, uh, you have to 
deal with his numbers very carefully because his beta lines are very, very rough estimate. But that's just to show you how you can make use of this, these things immediately. Yeah? You can also make it for, also do it for NATO, actually. But they didn't do it here. This case. But uh, from your this um, like equivalent statement, you can only follow that the alpha must be greater in Germany than in China, but you cannot say exact values. You cannot determine values for the alpha. Can you? Just I can. I come, come to this in a minute. Right. You're always faster than I, Florian. So that's the first simple empirical application. But you see, you can play around with. That's very nice. You can play around with this model, and I show you. I'll show you more. Uh, now let me come back to theory for one slide at least. And uh, let's think about the environmental Poussin curve. When do we get an environmental Poussin curve? Well, I can always order countries like this. So GDP per capita is not, not a problem. So if we have, in addition to that, if we have this ordering, that also the weighted GDP per capita are ordered like this at the same time, then I get from our theorem, then I get the meter visa structure of environmental Poussin curve. At least the upwards going part. That's what we would like to have, yeah? that the higher GDP per capita leads to a higher uh, consumption of electricity from renewable sources. That's what's happening. And uh, for example, that's very, very hypothetical. If you assume this identical uh, cost for renewable energy, then and if we have um, environmental Kuznets curve for the awareness, then I also get the environmental Kuznets curve for GDP spent on renewable energy sources. But once more, this assumption of identical betas is probably very, very hypothetical. So now let me come to the empirical Kuznets curve, environmental Kuznets curve. So also, the funny thing with this paper is it's very, with this model, it's very, very simple, actually. So what you do now is you go back to the first order condition that we had before, yeah, in our case. That's the first thing here. That's the first order condition. Now we do the following. We sum up, this is K1, K1 is the number of people in country one, so that's total consumption of electricity from renewable sources in country one and so on. I just sum up this one plus all the others and I get T. That's I call T. And that these numbers are in the statistical data, so they are available. You can just find, easily find them. Yeah. And uh, this alpha, alpha times T, I move to the other side of the equation, that's then alpha i minus ti. And I'm left with alpha i times omega i. So I end up with this extremely simple condition. I know everything in this condition. I know t, can find it in the statistical data. I know w i hat. There's again the issue that this beta i does play a role here. And I know ti. So I just can solve for alpha i, and I get immediately a value for alpha i. That's what it is. <laughs> so T, big T stands for Y, the original Y. The what? Big T stands for big T. Y. No, no, big T is uh, right. right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Big T is the original I, I just call it now. So, and then uh, we can draw the diagram again and we get this picture here. And now you see, oh, well, the now always is yeah, on the better, on the better end of the diagram. <laughs> So you see that uh, it's uh, quite interesting. But uh, again, this depends on these beta i's and it's a little bit, a little bit shaky. But just to show you how you can apply this, this thing. So it's quite actually quite simple to get an idea about this awareness things empirically. Also. Let me come to NATO. Finally, let me come finally to NATO. But Hans, I just have one thing is confusing. You know, there's the awareness thing, and when it goes up, we spend more on uh, this public good, which means emissions and so on. So why uh, to be aware? You know, to be free rider and don't be aware. No, no, awareness, so, awareness, awareness is costly. Awareness, awareness means this thing here. This is constant. It's the same for all countries. So you see what it what it makes a high awareness means that this distance becomes smaller. This drives you. So if I'm, if I'm a big country, uh, there's no need to be aware. <laughs> awareness is not good, it's, it's, it's costly. That's well, no, no, of course awareness is, is costly. Awareness is costly, but we get the benefit of the, of the environmental community. The big T. Yeah, that's what it is. And, uh, but if you think back about the structure of the model, that is, it's the same alpha I we used at the beginning, it's nothing different. 
Yeah? And at the beginning we said alpha i is related to this marginal rate of substitution, willingness to pay for the public commodity. That's what it is. So we observe that, for example, in, in Norway then, uh, at least uh, the particles for willingness to pay right. is higher in, in Norway than in other countries. Uh, but in this case, probably you didn't exclude hydro, right? Probably yes, hydro is excluded, still excluded. It's still excluded? It's still excluded. It's still excluded. It is. It is excluded, for sure, but, because but, it's but same. But then, uh, generation of electricity in Norway, I mean, it's mostly, mostly It doesn't mean, no, no, you have to be careful now. So I told you what the goal of the paper is also, I showed you this rather weird uh, drawings here. One goal of the paper is also to sort out things a little, little bit. The fact that you are producing a lot of energy from, from hydroelectricity, or using a lot of energy from hydroelectricity in Norway, doesn't mean that awareness is low. So awareness does not necessarily mean you are producing a lot of it. It just means, in some circumstances, you show that you are aware of the problem and you, you do things uh, in a certain environment. So Norway is in a different situation than other countries. And, but still, it could be uh, environmentally aware in this sense. That's a trick. Yeah? You should not look at just at the consumption of renewable energy sources. Then you get the diagram that I showed you at the beginning. It's just weird. There is nothing, no structure in it. That's a good one. Yeah? So, that's NATO. Nice curve. So, here we have. I use here a different scale. I think that it's also purchasing, purchasing power parity, but I think it's in current prices or whatever. So here we have, so it's not an environmental, it's not a, well, you can't talk about environmental business curve in terms of military spending, of course, but it's interesting. So here we have also countries, that's Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, countries with a low level of GDP per capita here, and they have, but they have the highest awareness for NATO. Also Estonia, Lithuania, they are also in this, in this area. Oh, well, they mean their soldiers go to serve. That's they, they are a little bit aware of, of, um, <laughs> that, that's the of value, the friends. Value of life. Of the here. friends coming from the other side here. Yeah. Again, Norway, I think, is here somewhere, of course, in, the, in, this, in this area here. Yeah. That doesn't matter. But again, we get a nice picture which shows, I think, which uh, at least shows some relation to what we think. I think we will believe that Estonia should be, mere, should be more aware about NATO. Then, for example, Germany or, or Norway or whatever. Yeah? And we can also do exercises like this. For example, we could look at NATO members in 1970, so without the, the, the new ones. And we could see how did awareness change between 1970 and 2011 among these older members. Yeah, we see that the United States, France, awareness increased a little bit, and uh, Norway actually decreased. Here, Turkey, state, it's the same, more or less. And, uh, so I just want to show how you can play around with, with this data now. And, uh, you could, uh, if you would only look at these 1970 countries, which were in the NATO in 1970, and you would, uh, you would map it against the income, would you also have this curve? No, we get this curve here. Yeah. I think uh, something like this also. You get this curve yeah. as well? I think so. It is so which means that the richer people become, the less they are concerned about defense. Exactly. <laughs> I can interpret it in probably different ways, but this would be one, expl one explanation. Yeah. The more the richer they become, the lazier they get, and uh, the less concerned they get. <laughs> it's <laughs> the Roman Empire, as you can. Yeah, it's a Roman, Roman <laughs> Empire. Roman, Roman, Empire. Roman Empire, exactly. <laughs> Gato, thank you very much. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <That was a, laughs> <laughs> I suggest we Russian <laughs> Well, so just uh, to show you what, what, what you can. You can also, for example, uh, just check, uh, uh, base, you know, there is this, in the, in the environmental business, we have this two degree goal. In NATO, we have the 2% goal that each NATO member should contribute 2% of GDP to, towards military expenditures. Yeah? And uh, of course, we, right now we are far away from that. Most countries are far away from that. But then you could look. Using, using awareness and should look what, what could you do, which countries should you target in order to reach this goal the fastest way. It's also interesting. You can do that. Yeah? And it, I think that you can play around with these things. It's quite nice. So that was basically my, my talk. I just wanted to show that uh, what I tried to do. We have these weird pictures in the beginning. We know that diversity play a role. Diversity amongst the countries. Yeah? Historical, uh, hist uh, economic diversity, I don't know what. 
And we try to aggregate this diversity into this one parameter awareness. So we try to sort things out to, between economic issues and this, this awareness issues. Okay? And then we can somehow uh, arrive at this, these differences that I, I tried to, to show you. This. Well, here are some uh, possible extensions. I already mentioned the 2% goal of NATO. We could also, I think, address the issue of coalition formation. For example, in, in the Paris, it will be likely that there are coalitions among developing countries for the climate business. So we could set up a different NASH, NASH game in this case. Yeah, it's possible for sure. We could do that. But you could also do what I tried to some extent, but it's relatively difficult to look where uh, we have this diversity. We can measure diversity. It's diversity between GDP per capita and awareness at the beginning. What is the NASH mechanism to do it? So if you look at the contributions to renewable energy sources, is diversity among these contributions less than before? Yeah, use inequality measures, or is it increasing? And the results that I have to show that it's decreasing, at least in general. So, so, so the NASH mechanism is trying, or is bringing the countries closer together. So it's an interesting result. So, and uh, well, that's what I mentioned here. Anyway, I think it's an, an area of, of research with many possibilities and many interesting things which I didn't have time to explore in, in all details, but uh, I'm sure there are many, many things to be done. So, thank you very much. Yes. Any questions? Actually, I do. <laughs> no, I, it is this, if I'm not mistaken, is awareness, uh, the connection of awareness with the environmental fitness curve is a bit different with respect to the way I used to look at the Kuznets curve usually, right? Because typically I associate the environmental Kuznets curve with some negative thing that then improves. While awareness by itself is a positive thing. Just a positive thing. Right? So uh, that what I'm trying to figure out is when you speak of awareness and what you find for awareness is compatible with the other type of environmental goodness curve that I have in mind. So basically this, this um, evolution of awareness, it, does this lead to the environmental goodness curve, let's say on the emissions that we expect? Uh, are, are they related? In, in, uh, so with respect to emissions, we don't see anything. I showed you the diagram with the emissions yeah. based on structure in it. Yeah? And the reason is that there are too many things play a role and you have to, what I try to separate a little bit. Yeah? That's why we get results in this case. Uh, why we don't have this nice uh, environmental Kuznets curve that I showed you at the beginning? Well, uh, it doesn't show up, first of all, here. But uh, the, the important thing is, of course, that uh, the, the positive part of the environmental Kuznets curve, that things get better once we cross the certain threshold level. Yeah? And that's what we have here. The positive part is that the uh, GDP capital is increasing, and we are fine. And the countries that I have here, they are all, I think they are all, uh, NX1 countries, so they belong to industrialized countries of, of Kyoto Protocol. So we should not expect this, uh, the other, other part of the, the environmental process. Maybe you should, if we include uh, developing countries, it might be different. I just don't know. Uh, if, if this, and I was saying because anyway, I mean, even though we don't see an environmental process curve, we see just the left yeah, side, okay. but this one still is compatible, right? Any raising level of awareness is actually one of the preconditions yes. to see there. So this is actually compatible with the environmental goodness curve on, on the negative yes. side. So even though we don't see the, so in a sense, uh, that's why I was, I wanted to understand if you are expected to find this also here, or if this actually would be already, it's already enough it's already to important. justify the environmental goodness curve that's of the emission. That's, so. that's, that's the important part, yeah? yeah? The other part is actually the negative 